Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Just Hilarious, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Boxing legend. An icon, Andre Ward, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. How you feeling, bro? I'm yeah. good, man. Happy to be here. How are you, sir? Man, I'm good, man. I'm I'm juggling, you know, mm-hmm. but it's all good. Mm-hmm. I'm 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 I'm, wor- I'm working it out. Uh, well, I hope y'all have read Andre Ward's book already, Killing the Image, a Champion's Journey of Faith, Fighting, and Forgiveness. You've always been like notoriously, mm-hmm. you know, private with your personal life yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. How did you know now was the time to reveal it all in a book? Man, it's been it's been a, it's been a few years coming, you know. Um you know, I've said it many times, you know, promoting this book, like I'm an 80s baby, mm-hmm. you know, and I was raised to not share my business, mm-hmm. my, my family's business, you know, and it's it's not about this day and age because people overshare, that people think that like being private is some weird or, you know, mm-hmm. something, something sneaky about you, what you hide. And it's like, nah, that's a superpower to like keep my business to myself and not, and not share it. So... But as I'm getting in the game and I'm mentoring a lot of guys, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell them, like, bro, I understand what you're going through. I've been yeah. there, done that. And they're like, nah, you always been like this. And it's like, nah, bro, like, I'm telling you, I, pro- I did more than you. So I start getting discontent and start feeling like, man, they don't have the full story. And I was talking to my pastor, man, and he was like, Dre, you got to kill the image. Mm. And I'm like, what you mean? And he was like, nah, who you are is real, but it's not who you've always been. You can tell that story now. Mm-hmm. For well, people that don't know who Andre Ward is and how you got into boxing, break that down a little bit. What got you into boxing? What made you love boxing? My daddy, my daddy. I was a uh, my first love was baseball. You know, I was a pitcher and a shortstop, and but I was always competitive, always, you know, just competitive. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a sore winner and a sore loser. And my daddy started telling me about his amateur career. He's, you know, he was a 15 and 0 as a heavyweight. I'm like, what you mean you box? And my dad, you know, he, like I said, he raised me as a single parent. So I'm like, I want to do it. I ain't even think about it. And that was like, that was the first seed that was sown. And my dad being my dad, you know, and I talk about this in the book. He's like, man, we're going to do it. We're going to do it right. You're not going to quit. But the first day I walked in that gym, man, it, it was love at first sight. And I didn't even really understand what that was. I just knew the sights and the sounds, the speed bag, the heavy bag, you know, the smells of the gym, you know, hearing people ha, 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 hitting the bag and sparring. I knew I loved it. I knew I loved it. I wasn't very good. When we first started. Um, was he hard on you? Very. Mm-hmm. But that's why my dad couldn't train me. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad was, you know, he was all or nothing. You know, I told you to get your bleep bleep hands up, man. Get, what you doing? Move your head. And me, I was shut down. I don't mm-hmm. respond to that. And shortly after I started, we met Virgil, my godfather, lifelong trainer. And, and Virgil had a different finesse about him. Mm-hmm. You know, he would, he would, hey, baby, try this. Do this. Get your hands up now. I responded to that. So my dad was wise enough to pass me on to Virgil. We don't hear those stories enough uh, about single fathers. Yes. Raising it's rare. kids. Mm-hmm. How yeah. did that impact you? Not have a, a mother in the house. You always hear about not yeah. having a father in the house. How mm-hmm. did it impact you not having a mother in the house? Man, it, it, I, the good part of it was uh, I, got, I got to see a man get up every day and go to work. My father would always say, you know, I got my struggles. And my father, he struggled with heroin addiction. Mm-hmm. But he was a functional addict. And my mother was a full blown addict. You know, she was in San Francisco. I'm in the East Bay, and she's completely in her addiction. And my dad would say, "I don't care what I'm going through. I'm not leaving." Mm-hmm. You know. So just seeing him get up every day, he owned his own business. Get up every day and go to work. He struggled at night. He had that monkey on his back when he came home. But that showed me what manhood was about. That gave me a strength about me and a confidence about me. Not having the mother there, that uh, I didn't have that nurturing. Mm-hmm. I was raised by a bachelor. I didn't have that 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 gentleness, that balance that, 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 that a young man needs. So mm-hmm. now when I get into a relationship, I wonder why I got mistrust and distrust for this young lady, my wife Tiffany, mm. that I'm that I say I love. Mm. Yeah. I can't seem to trust because the most important woman in my life at the time, she wasn't there. Mm. So it took me time, Charlemagne, to um start realizing the mother wound. We talk about father wounds, but the mother mm-hmm. wound that I had going into adulthood and how that followed me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize this until later in life. And I had to do do a lot of work. And, you know, I'm in a much better place now. But not having my mother there, it definitely impacted me for how, sure. How did you it get over that? It. I'm sorry, Jeff. Not good. I, I was going to say, how did you get over that? I not, mean, not having a mom in your life. Like you said, that sensitive side, that nurturing yeah. side. Because, you know, dads, especially in that era, is yeah. you fall, get your ass back. Yeah. You better, you better yeah. not cry. Yeah. That was dads yeah. back then. Yeah. But you didn't have that other side of mom said, well, let me let me hug you. Let me hold Absolutely. you. Let me make you feel better. So how did you get over that? I mean, the first thing is just identifying what it was. 
took a lot of lumps to get there. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm, you know, I'm not trusting and I'm blaming her. Mm. I'm not, I'm not, you know, loving her the way I should and I'm blaming her. And it just took me, you know, really when I crossed over and got out the streets and really settled down and gave my life to God, I started really being able to hear my thoughts and really put the patterns together and then remember the struggles that my dad had. Mm-hmm. Like, man, my dad struggled with this too. And then getting around, you know, they say a few good men, my pastor and a, a couple of good core brothers that I have and just them helping me identify certain things and talking through that stuff. And for me, when I talk through things with the right person, I, it, it's it's cathartic. It's, it's, it's therapeutic. Like even mm-hmm. writing a book, like, it's a lot of pain. You're pulling off old scabs and old wounds, but but the end is is good. So really just identifying what it was, understanding what it was, acknowledging it, and then allowing the help to help me. I wonder how did that, uh, how, you, you talk about your, 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 your wife, but I'm talking about this relationship with women, period. Yeah. How did that af- affect you not having a mom? How did you look at women like throughout your whole life? Man, like I said, it was just distrust and mistrust. Yeah. Yeah. Did it ever come to a point like where your wife, where y'all on the verge of divorce or separation, or yeah. was she just always very patient and understood from the jump? What oh no, we went at it for sure. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you got to realize too, we started super young. Like mm. first, old? first child, we we met in high school. Mm. First child, sixteen years old. Mm. Second child, eighteen years old. And I'm living with Verge, like I said, my godfather trainer and his wife, and she mad. We going at it, and Verge sit us down. This is how you want to carry yourself as a wife and as a woman. Dre. And he I felt like he was always taking her side. I'm like, why are you always taking her side? You nah, he said, listen, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you, man. Mm-hmm. Sit down and stop talking. And he would just sit us down mm-hmm. and break it down. He would open the word and say, Man, this is how you're supposed to carry yourself. Now look, when he go to the gym all, and this is again, we 17, 18 years old, 19 years old. He go to the gym all day. Don't as soon as he come through the door, start yelling at him and telling him what he didn't do. You got to give him a chance to unwind, take a shower, eat, and then go talk to him. So I see her listening. Then he get on me. Man, you need to stop reacting like that, bro. You tripping. It was that type of counseling that we had. That wasn't even like formal counseling, Mm -hmm. but it was him sitting down. And this is in the middle of him going through his own personal marital stuff. Mm. He would sit us down to educate us about what he believed a wife was supposed to look like, be like, and what a husband was supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot. And this is as growing up as teenagers, y'all like grew up together. Yeah. Well, she she is from Seattle, mm. and I'm from the Bay. And my half brother, I don't call him my half, it's my brother. But you know, we got different different moms, different different um, same father, different mothers. We went to high school together for you know to I think his junior year, my sophomore year. He went back to Seattle. I went to go visit him. I met her. Mm. That's how we locked in. Mm-hmm. And you know, I talk about it in the book. For me, it was love at first sight. I'm like, man, who is that? Mm-hmm. You know. What's her name? Yeah. And we locked in, you know, that weekend. And and we've been together ever since. But it got to a point where I'm ripping and running. I'm going up there to see her. I'm getting on Greyhound. 20-hour bus ride from from North Oakland to, to Seattle mm. because I'm whipped. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I know I, I don't know what love is completely, but but I feel like I love her. Mm-hmm. And Verse said, look, man, what is it going to take for you to stop running into this wall? and 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 Because we, we got three years, bro, before the Olympics. What is it going to take? I said, I want her with me. And he brought her down. And that's where we live with them. And I'm trying to chase my dream and clean my life up and get myself together and get ready for these Olympics. But she was also there with me. How mm-hmm. did they know you were the, the the one when it came to boxing? You know, because everybody, I mean, you, you go to these gyms, everybody, everybody, like you know, the one. everybody <laughs> thinks they're the one. You go to Gleason's and everybody's yeah. like, they're the next. How did they know that you were the one out of all that? What, what was that something that somebody seen? I think... Uh, it didn't start out like that. You know, like I said, I think it just started out as something I wanted to do. And I went in there and I had to really pay my dues the first couple of years. Like I was getting beat all over the ring. Cause you said the Olympics, like you was ready yeah. for it. But it got to a certain point where once I overcame in that gym after that first year, we call it being battle tested. Once I got battle tested in that gym, then it was like, all right, let's go to the nationals. Once I won my first national title at 10 years old in 1996, um, I actually, beat Curtis Stevens who from uh, Brooklyn Brownsville mm-hmm. um, and he was my rival once I did that I think everybody started saying that man he could be the one and it sound crazy right I'm 10 years old but I kept winning and I kept winning and then we start you know verge to counter and saying but we got nine years to the Olympics we got seven years and I just I turned into this prodigy and I gave up my whole childhood to do it mm-hmm. so it went from me looking like I might not have it to all of a sudden 
he's going to be the one. So at a certain point, it became a foregone conclusion. I'm going to go to the Olympics, win a gold medal, turn pro, win championships, and make a lot of money. Like, that just was the conversation in my home. It mm. sounds crazy, but that's what it was. I want to go back to your parents just for a couple more questions. Were you ever afraid that the disease of addiction would, would, would get you? It did get me. Oh, man. Mm. Yeah, it did get me. And, and it wasn't a long time, but it was long enough. I had a two, three-year stint where, you know, some people say generational curses, some people say generational patterns. They had me. Mm. And... I was already, you know, dibbling with weed and, and starting to drink probably 16 years old. I mean, it, it, it really stemmed from this, I believe. Like I said, my mother was a, was a full-blown addict. My daddy was a functional addict. Once I started realizing that my dad was struggling mm-hmm. and I no longer was buying the lines and oh, I'm just, you know, he would, my dad would go to work all day and he would come home and, and, and you know, talk to me and my brother and he would go up in that room and he would always have a water run and it'd be like, an hour, two hours. And when my daddy came out, his face was flushed and he just acting funny, he slurring. And I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. Then I started putting, putting it together. Mm-hmm. I found a needle. I'm questioning him about that. Then I got to the age where I'm like, man, you getting high. Then that bitterness and that, that resentment and all that anger started to rise up. So what I do is I go to what's familiar to my family, alcohol and drugs. But I'm hiding at this point. Mm-hmm. When my father dies at, 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 at 18 years old, that was my excuse just to go buck wild, and I did. Let me let me ask you a question. Jess and I were talking about this a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and this is a no judgment zone, but I always wanted to know, like, when you see something affect your family in a, yeah. in a negative way, right? We, yeah. I think we were talking about Bow Wow. Bow Wow yeah. was talking about he see Mac Miller do lean and yeah. he passed away from it, but then he tried it. Yeah. And I always wanted to know the mind frame of somebody seeing it destroy somebody, but saying... I'm gonna try it. Yeah. I can overcome it. Like, what's that yeah. mind frame? Because you see what it do, yeah. what it's doing, yeah. Yeah. and you see what it does, but you still say, "Fuck it, I'm gonna try yeah. it. it." It depends, bro. You got to realize this force is behind them generational curses. It ain't just natural. Mm-hmm. Right. It's forces behind that, and them forces follow you generationally, and you don't have to give in to it. But once you open that door and you say, "Yeah, I'm gonna try this," mm-hmm. now it's on. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't. Uh, emotionally, mentally mature enough to be able to make those decisions. All I knew was I was hurting. Mm. I'm dealing with depression. I'm dealing with anxiety. Um, And I don't know that that's what it is. All I know is when I drink something or when I smoke something, I don't feel that way no more. Yeah, That edge is taken off. Temporarily. Mm -hmm. But once I got myself together and, you know, I got clean and I got, I kicked all of that stuff, then I started thinking the way you said, Mm. I'm never going to touch that again. I got to do something different for my kids. But, I wasn't at that stage. I didn't have that kind of strength and power. And it's interesting, too, because my dad, my grandfather, Harold, he was an, a functional alcoholic. Great man, but he had a drinking problem. My dad vowed I never, I never touch a drink because my dad only told me he loved me when he was, when he was drunk. Mm, wow. And he never did. But then he turned to heroin. So it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Would you say you replaced one addiction with another when you took up boxing? I wouldn't say I, I replaced it. I, I would say, man, I got free. And I would say that um, I just channeled who I am as a person, that drive, that focus toward the right thing. You know, I don't look at boxing like an addiction. And I always have tried to, and it's not easy, man. I don't want to sit here and act like it's, a, it's an easy thing. But I've always tried to keep that sport in its proper place because I knew it would end one day. Mm-hmm. And I'm fortunate that God always put me around people who would walk that walk. My pastor, Napoleon Kaufman, former Raider, he played All-American in college, six years as a as a, as a uh, uh, professional running back, and then he did. He went into ministry and never looked back. I had him to talk to me. Dre, listen, man, this is what you do. It's not who you are. God's got other stuff for you, bro. Just, hey, enjoy it. Give it all you got, but it's not going to always be there. Mm-hmm. So I had people like that in my ear, so when the time came, the impact wasn't as hard. What effect did losing your father have on you? And, and what was your relationship like? My, I mean, my dad was my mother and my father for many, many years. Mm-hmm. That was my everything. And it, it's had a profound effect, and I still feel it to this day. Now, the sting isn't as, uh, as strong, um, but I have times when I'm with my kids and I just drift off, and I'm thinking like, man, my dad could see this right now. Mm. He lived long enough to see my first child, Dre Jr., and Tiffany was pregnant with our second child, Malachi, and then he passed uh, in 2002. I have moments like that. I think about how my career would have been different if my dad was here. Mm-hmm. I think about me helping my dad and, and giving back to him and buying him a house or 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 just, you know, just, just doing life with him. Mm-hmm. I, I wish I had my father there 
to talk about life. I got questions, man. Even at, even at 40 years old, I just turned 40, man. I'm still trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think about that stuff all, all the time, Charlamagne. It's a, it was a devastating loss, man. Devastating loss. But um, I don't want to ever say I got over it, but I've been able to cope with it, deal with it, and, and you know, uh, hopefully make him proud with the life that I live. Because you retired at 33. Yeah. Young. Yeah. Undefeated and all that, right? Yeah. So... If your dad was here, you would have went, would have gone longer. You you believe so? I don't know. Or what? Like my dad loved boxing, but he wasn't like my dad was always focused on the man. Mm -hmm. You know, like he was always focused on me and my character and type of play. That mm -hmm. he was always big on that. So I don't. My dad, I don't think my dad would have been trying to push me to stay in the sport. I think it probably would have been the opposite. Mm -hmm. He he might have wanted me to end it a little bit earlier than what I did. How did you know yeah. it was time then? Because he was undefeated. Like he, yeah, thirty three. Relatively young in the sport, mm -hmm. like, yeah. like what made you? How did you know it's time to hang the gloves up? Man, I I, I started feeling it two three years before I did it, and I would always ask the other athletes, man, how did you know? And they would all say the same thing: you just gonna know. Mm -hmm. You gonna wake up one day and you don't want to do it. So I started hearing myself, Charlemagne, say that R word, retired three four years before I would just say stuff, and I'd be like, bro, you hear what you just said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I and I would I would be aware of that I'm self aware like yo man, you you talking like that but I still had to drive I'm still looking good I'm still sharp and um, went through the lawsuit period with my promoter going through that where you know money going out ain't no money coming in and I'm like look man I'm gonna end this on my terms they trying to starve me out if 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 I'm gonna go out I'm gonna go out on my own terms my pastor like no nah, don't do it my wife like it's too it's premature don't do it don't don't send that that letter out you just wrote and got through that. Had my run with Rock Nation for three years, mm -hmm. and uh, it got to the point after the first Kovalev fight, um, I thought I was done after that. Mm -hmm. My body was starting to break down. You know, I've had multiple knee surgeries and stuff, and it wasn't boxing related. It's just all the preparation, all the training. And, man, you just want your freedom back. Yeah. Like, I'm the type of person that when I do something, I really do it. Like, I'm locked in. Like, it's just the way I am. I didn't want to be that guy all the time. My mm -hmm. body's starting to break down. My kids were in high school. It was like all these mitigating circumstances, Charlemagne, that start adding up. And, you know, I'm 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 a numbers cruncher, so I'm crunching mm -hmm. the numbers like, man, okay, if I get this 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 much on my money <laughs> every <laughs> year, and it wasn't it just like it, it, my pastor was like, bro, you're not gonna be able to figure that out. You gonna have to step out on faith. So if mm -hmm. you if you want to walk, you gotta walk in faith. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna stay, you gotta stay in faith. So I went and talked to him after Kovalev won, and I was like, man, I think I'm done. I haven't been in the gym in, in three months, and that's not like me. I'm like, man, I have no desire to be in no gym. I just fought the dude that they said I wasn't going to fight and won a close decision. Everybody's like, oh, you lost, you this and that. I said, man, what am I doing this for? And he sat there, and I just, I just knew he was going to co-sign what I was saying. He sat there, he was like, I think I can see you doing one more. And I'm like, yeah, but I ain't got the desire. He said, once you go, you, you, that fire will come back. And I remember leaving his office disappointed because every time I talk about retirement, every time I talk about getting my freedom back, somebody always giving me a reason to stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's weird, right? Like I knew I was going to miss it, but I'm also fighting to get out of it. And this is after I did this since I was nine. So people don't do the math. You're just 33, but you got to date that back to nine years old. Mm -hmm. And the toll, the, the toll that that takes mentally, physically, emotionally, the things that I missed, the things that I couldn't be a part of and do, the mm -hmm. pressure that I have on me. I hadn't lost a fight since I was 14 years old. That's pressure. Dang. So you get to a point that even though I can do this, I don't know if I want to do this. Went and fought Kovalev the second time, and I knew it was time. When you say freedom, like what do you mean? Like the simple things like wanting to eat what you want to eat or not having to be on the training regimen? Like what do you mean when you say freedom? Boxing consumes you. I feel like it has to if you're going to be elite. Like if I was on this trip right now, I would have to be doing the math on when was the last time I ran. Mm. Like I eat now, I try to eat good for my health, but I would have to eat good for performance, mm -hmm. right? Where you weighed at? Where, hey man, you when you coming back? All of that kind of stuff. My, I was always on the clock. Always an obligation. Mm -hmm. Always on the clock. Mm -hmm. And nobody put more pressure on me than me. So I was tired of myself. I need a break <laughs> for me because I know how I get with competition. Or, or. I need a break for me. And it's been a blessing though I miss it and I have to be on the clock and to be able to enjoy my life and say, I don't have nowhere to be. Sometimes I go to the gym, the gym I go to, uh, the lab in San Ramon, my boy my boy Bobby owns it. And uh, they won't see me for a week. Where you at, bro? I said, bro, I got time in. Mm -hmm. I deserve to miss a week or two right if I want to miss a week or two. That feels good to be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to do that if I was active. Well, let me ask you a question. You said you were undefeated since 14. Do you feel like, and I ask every boxer when they come up here, 
Do you feel like that undefeated category messes up boxing now where people, instead of fighting fights, they just, yeah. they're looking for the perfect fight to keep yeah. it undefeated, to keep yeah. the money coming in, to keep the sponsorships, to keep the, the pay-per-views big? Because you and Floyd kind of effed up the game with that. Fault. Yeah, it's our fault. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. At least you own it. You employ okay. yeah. the game with yeah. it. Yeah, it, it, it's messing up the game a little bit, but it's also the game. The game is messing up the game in some respects, and the fighters are messing up the game in some respects, right? And what I mean is, we put a lot of stock into a loss in boxing. MMA don't do that. You got cats that are still revered, respected, all that. They got six, seven losses, but he's that name. He's that guy. We respect him. It's not like that in boxing. Mm -mm. If a if a young guy coming up, if Javante Davis, Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney take a loss. Oh, my goodness. They you, take a loss now? It oh used to goodness. be like that, though. Mm. It used huh? to be. All these amazing, like, nobody cared. You lost, yeah. they come back and you get a rematch. Yeah. But now, you yeah. lose. It's like, oh, it's finished. It's yeah, so, so so that's part of it is the game, the way the game responds to us. And then it is the fighters, right? Like, some guys have to fight competition to make good money. But if you crack the code and you able to have a fan base without fighting top competition, where's the motivation to fight top competition? That's mm -hmm. right. So you had pretty boy Floyd, the first 10 years of his career where he had to get it out the mud and prove and show and scratch for every dollar. Then he crossed over to Money May. Now I can fight who I want to fight. So the youngsters, they don't want the pretty boy Floyd era. They want the Money Mayweather era. Mm. That's what the game is doing right now. So it's, a pro, it's pros and cons because mm. for so many years, fighters took huge risk and got no money. So if I'm an heir on the side, I'm, I'm going to say, man, get your money. Say you the best, even though you ain't fought the best. I respect your hustle. You able to get it that way. But for so many years, it was the opposite. So now it's shifted. So I think it's it's a fine line, right? Because everybody wants you to go fight that person right now, do this. Well, hold on. Make sure the money right. Make sure the, the business handle will do that. So it's pros and cons to the era that we're in right now in boxing. I think about stuff like that, right? And I, I just use somebody like Canelo as an example. He's an, he's an all-time great. But yeah. then there's certain fights we wanted to see. Like maybe you you, you and Canelo. Yeah. Even now they say him and Benavidez. And I'm like, well, if he doesn't fight Benavidez, do you really put that as a strike against him? Yeah. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. Okay. And the Canelo fans, they, they call me a hater because I'm telling the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, me and this guy, Canelo, we never had, we never looked each other's way, different way class, and we, we shouldn't have. Like we, he didn't, and people say Canelo dug me, he didn't dug me. The only reason why we brought up in the same category is because we had a common opponent, mm -hmm. Sergey Kovalev, when I retired, so people start connecting the dots. Now you fought him, fight Dre now, call mm -hmm. Dre out. So I don't, I'm, I'll never say Canelo ducked me because he didn't. It wasn't even on his radar, it wasn't on my radar. But in terms of his resume, it's a little website called boxrec.com. Mm -hmm. And if you know what you're looking at, you can look at them, the opponents that he fought, right? And people say, he fought this name and fought that name. Where did he fight that name when he fought him? Mm. He 32. He coming off two losses. He 35. Kovalev, when he fought Kovalev, Kovalev was cooked. He wasn't the crusher. He wasn't the undefeated guy. He had lost that. And I'm not knocking the hustle. Mm -hmm. But you lose me when you start saying, I'm, I'm the best fighter in the world. Or you lose me when you feel like you don't have to fight the best, but then everybody else got to fight the best. Canelo is a, is a really good fighter, man. But you don't really know how good you are until you fight the other best. Now, you shouldn't fight other top guys every fight out. That's not wise and that's not safe. Mm -hmm. You need tune-up fights. You need, you know, you need them kind of fights. But when most of your fights are like that, come on, man. But, but if Benavidez was to beat him now, wouldn't people say the same thing? Oh, Canelo's older. He's been in the ring a long time. Maybe he lost. That's the risk you take. Mm. That's the risk you take. Mm. Who's the best, the best boxer of all time to you? Man, and why? That's come on, Envy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you, you're asking on, a man Envy. who's ranked number twelve. I know. According I'm to, just uh, asking him. Come on, Envy. Record. All time. Yes, sir. It's tough that we can go back and forth about that forever. I look at it like who who are my greats, mm -hmm. right? Like who are my goats? And Roy Jones, mm -hmm. Bernard Hopkins, Floyd Mayweather. That's my era. I'm a hybrid of all three of those guys. And of course, you got the Sugar Ray Robinsons. If you're talking all time. You got Muhammad Ali, if you're talking all time. Mm -hmm. um, but why those three individuals? Why Bernard? Why Floyd? That's who I gauged at. That's who I took from. Roy. That I'm a hybrid of all three of them. I can shift and be Bernard Hopkins one round. I can be Floyd Mayweather the next round. I can be a young Roy Jones the next round. That's who I looked up to. That's who I stole from the most. So those those are my three goats. Mm -hmm. But I'm also, like I said, Robinson, Ali, you can't leave them dudes out. And other people. Mm -hmm. Salvador Sanchez. 
you know, Mexican fighter that, you know, he died in a car accident, lost his life very, very early. Great fighter. He would have continued to win. So we can go back and forth about that all all day long. But I look at it like, who are your greats? Who are your goats? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to go back to just Canelo real quick. But who hasn't he fought? It's <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of guys he ain't fought. He fought Triple G three times. Like he, he, Maybe I just know too much. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Like, Maybe I, like, I just know too much. From a boxing perspective, like, what, like, what's missing from his resume? He didn't even want to fight Golovkin. HBO pressed him, mm -hmm. made Golovkin get in the ring after one of his fights and call him out. So he had to respond and do that. Mm -hmm. And most of their fights were controversial. So it's like Canelo's a good fighter, man. But like, and that's why even when people talk about Floyd, I don't, I, I never say Floyd ducked this one and ducked that one. Floyd had 10 years of giving y'all them kind of fights. Mm -hmm. And he still took some tough fights even when he was getting older. But he earned the right to pick and choose at a certain point. I'm the show. Canelo hasn't. You got to fight good, and then you got to pick. Then you got to fight a guy that's not. He, it, it's too much ducking. Yeah, yeah. Who it, he it's too much. Just Benavidez, you think? Man, bro, I can go down the list. Like it, it's, it, but it keeps happening though. Like this guy could rise up, and then he will duck that dude. Oh, he, he just wants a payday. Like yeah, they want a payday. That's the <laughs> that's the position you in. What you think this is? Yeah. So I just feel like, man, when it's a guy that's a threat, like even even Dimitri Bivol, the dude you lost to, mm -hmm. you got to give him credit for going up and wait. But I yeah. feel like he miscalculated though. That was a miscalculation. And mm -hmm. if you the all time great, don't you want to get that back? Uh, he says he wants to rematch, but you know what's so interesting? That's, that's the, the key though. He yeah. He says it. he wants to rematch. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. So you got you got Benavidez right now, or you got Terrence Crawford, right? Oh, there's no credit if I fight Terrence Crawford. Well, you fought Amir Khan that was way smaller than you, and you knocked him out cold in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Center. I was there. You didn't feel no type of way about that, but now Terrence Crawford is too small, and you won't get credit. We we gotta we gotta be consistent. Mm -hmm. So I'm qualified to speak about this stuff. Mm. And and speak out against it because it's all kind of double standards in the game. So I try to mind my business, and then when I'm asked about it, I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest. Good fighter, mm -hmm. box office, got his country behind. You got to give him credit for all the the marketing and the money. Man, get that. But when you start talking about breaking down these resumes and start talking about who's the greatest, and you and you mentioning yourself with other all time Mexican greats, we gotta have a kind of conversation about that. So you don't think those two fights will happen, Crawford and uh, uh, Benavidez? It's not looking like it. Damn. But like, but like, but like the Golovkin situation, if they if they press him enough, he may give in. Mm -hmm. But listen, bro, get your money. But at some point, every now and again, you got to toe the line and say, oh, "You you the next one, come on." Mm -hmm. And he's just not doing it. There's no there's no appetite to do that. Is, is there any boxer that you looked at and be like, "I would have loved to fight him"? Ah man, it's hard for me to talk about the greats because I got a lot of respect for him. But I would have loved to have fought Floyd, just the styles. Um, Really, my three, Bernard and Floyd. At what weight, though? Huh? At what weight? It don't matter. Just, mm -hmm. just a, just a fantasy matchup. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bernard, Floyd, and Roy. I, I would have loved to have seen my style against their style. Mm -hmm. It would have been a mirror of, of themselves. So, um, yeah, that's that's probably the mm -hmm. three that, that I would I would have loved to to get. And really, you know, the the fight that should have happened was me and Golovkin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that's a fight that should have happened. Why didn't that happen? He didn't want it. Just scared. Yeah, I didn't say scared, but you you were the boogeyman. I just think, man, guys know they've been around the game long enough mm -hmm. where you don't have to be an analyst to be an analyst. They know this guy's a problem for me, and I'm not a bully in the game. You know, he was a he was a, a smaller weight class than me. He was 160, I was 168. But I take stuff personal when you start saying that I'm the boogeyman. Everybody's scared of me. Okay, then you say I'll fight anybody. I'm 160. I'll fight you at 168, which was my weight class, or 175. Now you're gonna get my attention, and I'm gonna speak out. And then when we, my team sends you an offer, right? And you, and you, oh, well, maybe two years from now, man, come on, bro. I just don't like or respect that kind of stuff. We're mm -hmm. fighters, bro. This is what we do, right? You can lie to me, but you lying to the fans. You know, your promoter, he, he. To this day, when I speak about this stuff, they get mad. Oh, you're lying. They go crazy on social media. Why are you so emotional if I'm lying? <laughs> what, what's wrong? I got emails yeah. right now that has them turning down a fight. My lawyer said they turn the fight down in less than 15 minutes. Right. Wow. So it's just sometimes a lot of talking, man. And then when it's time to walk, it don't. the, the song and the dance don't line up. I didn't know if Oakland make Andre Ward the man he is today. I'm going to be honest with you. I've heard you talk a lot. I ain't never heard you sign this Oakland. <laughs> 
Like, yeah. I got this. <laughs> 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 yeah. You sound like you about to rap. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. Like, how you do? Yeah. yeah. Man, that's um, just your accent, I feel. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hear it, obviously, but mm. yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all from the East Coast. You from. Baltimore? Baltimore, Baltimore, yeah. Yeah, I can hear that. For real? I, we from the yeah. Carolinas. I'm from New York. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. We was talking about it in the back. My boy Tay was like, yeah, I can hear that Baltimore in there. <laughs> um, man, it's just, man, the city, the city as a whole, just blue collar. Um, and, you know, my other brothers from, you know, like Marshawn Lynch and many others that come from from Oakland, man, we just, we just, like, it's really about action, bro. It's really not about a lot of talking. That's how I carry myself in the game, you know, uh, just blue collar. Mm-hmm. And and you got that grit and that determination about you. That's what Oakland represents to me. And I love it because they say we're a small market, but but I feel like we got some of the best talent in the world. Mm-hmm. And I love people saying, "Oh, that's that boy from Oakland." Mm-hmm. And and that's what they used to say in the amateurs. You know, oh, he from Oakland. Cause I'm I, you know I'm, I'm around kids the Nationals. You got kids from everywhere, Midwest, East Coast, and they would always man, you talk weird. I'm like, y'all talk weird to me, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like. And they think California is L.A. I'm like, it's not L.A. I'm I'm mm. in the Bay. And I had to educate them on what the Bay was. I love representing my city, man. Mm. Uh, it's just blue collar, Charlotte, man. Mm. Just get it out the mud. Uh, other than the accent, you know, in the, in the getting it out the mud, what from Oakland stays with you at all times? That you carry I just, everywhere. I, I, just think, I just think the mentality, like I said, just blue right. collar. Mm-hmm. Just willing to roll up your sleeves and work. Mm-hmm. You know? You got some places where it's a lot of show, right? I think it's... We're the type of people that when the lights come on and it's time to go to work, we're ready. When did you realize you were turning generational curses into generational blessings? Mm, that's a good question, man. I think when when I start allowing God to get me together, mm. when I start, my, my eyes started to get clear and I started to see things right, when I started to learn what it meant to, to, to mourn my father's death, didn't know what that meant. When I started being honest about where I was and, and, and being honest about my emotions and feelings, when I started acknowledging the mother wound and, and how it was affecting my relationship with Tiffany, like when I started, like that, that's, I believe that's being a real man. Mm-hmm. When I was able to humble myself and really start acknowledging these things, I started sensing that I was, I was shifting the paradigm. The paradign was shifting. And generationally, the, the curse has to stop with somebody. Mm-hmm. And I believe that God was using me and my wife to, stop a lot of the things that have been in our family generational, even even poverty, mm-hmm. certain poverty mentalities. Mm-hmm. And I just believe God was helping me and my wife to break that. So self, it started with me. I got to get me right. I can't lead a family. Mm-hmm. I can't lead my wife. I can't lead my kids. I can't do it unless I'm getting myself together. Perfect, by no means. But I'm saying them blatant things, them blatant sins, them mm-hmm. things that generational things that we're talking about, I can't do those things and be the proper leader. When it comes to God, do you remember the moment or event that caused you to like really strengthen your faith and your belief in my, God? My father always gave me a foundation in the word. And it's interesting because I didn't grow up in the church like that, but my father had an understanding. He would open up the Bible and say, man, you got, you know, I, I probably gave my life to God probably like 20 times when I was a kid, just making sure that it, it worked. You know what I'm saying? And just young, not knowing no better. And, but I always had a respect and a reverence for God. And, you know, when I started getting notoriety, like, you know, I'm aging myself right now, but the newspapers would come to the, to the school and they would want to do an article on me and my brother. My dad would be like, man, you are, make sure you give God glory and stuff. And I didn't really fully understand it. I was scared to do it at that time. My brother, he was outspoken. This dude, we're Christian. I'm like, bro, shut up, bro. Like, <laughs> man, you always like, I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. He was there, mm-hmm. but that's where it started. And, but that was my father's faith. And then when I started going through life and then I lost him, I was angry at God. I didn't want nothing to do with church, God, nothing. Mm. Like you allowed this to happen. I didn't acknowledge that I was already mm-hmm. slipping and tripping before my dad died. It was his fault. And every time I would smoke something, every time I would drink something, every time I'd be in a situation, I felt like my conscience was still there. I wasn't completely gone. But I would think, man, you're not supposed to be doing this, bro. Mm -hmm. And Verge used to tell me, and I talk about this in the book, Verge was not only a boxing trainer, but he worked in the probation department at Juvenile Hall for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And Verge had had and has a gift for young men. He can look at you and say something, make you laugh, but also get at you at the same time. And he used to sit there in the kitchen, man, in, in, uh, in East Oakland, man, where we lived. And he would say, he'd say, brother, you ain't gonna get, God ain't gonna let you get away with nothing. And this is when I'm in the thick of it. 
And I would get mad and be like, man, why you hating on me, man? I'm just trying to do my thing and live my life. He said, look, man, I hear you. But I'm telling you, God ain't going to let you get away with nothing. And sure enough, I'd be in a car full of dudes. You, come here. I couldn't get away with nothing. Mm -hmm. I could do a little bit, but every time I try to step it up. So those things were starting to chip away at me. And I knew, even though I'm still doing, I knew like, man, this ain't going to last long. I'm not going to have a long career in the streets. I'm just not. Mm. So it was that kind of stuff, Charlemagne, when I'm in the thick of my situation and I'm rejecting him, he's still running after me, right? And it wasn't to the point to where life was really happening. I had another child um, and stuff just start piling up. I had to look up and have a conversation with God, man. I had a, uh, I was off some ecstasy. And I talk about this in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the book and my heart racing. And I knew I was going to die. I just knew it. And it took that, Charlemagne, for me to get through my anger, get through my frustration. When the pressure hit, I knew where to go. And I looked up and had a conversation with God. Mm. And he essentially made a deal with him. Man, you let me live. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm sorry. And I, I had this. And I made it through that, obviously. Wow. Mm. And that was the start of my journey. Did it happen overnight? No. But I started softening my heart i started being open to god again i started being i started listening to verge a little bit more you know the window was closing for the olympics i'm probably two years out at this point and it was little by little man but slowly but surely man when i saw god supernaturally take the desire and the taste for alcohol drugs and everything else from me some people may have to go to a program and i don't knock that everybody got their different mm -hmm. stuff yeah. but when i saw that happen i was like man this stuff is real when I started to develop my own faith and my own relationship and I started to sense and feel God speaking to me and helping me and it wasn't just my father's faith no more. That was that was a, that was a memorial. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And then giving me the power and to sustain me through all these years in a sport like boxing, being a young father and and a young husband like, man, I'm not that good. Like without a relationship with God and having that power working in my life. Oh, y'all going to be reading about me on the bottom of the ticker. Mm. Mm. For sure. In my mind, one one part of my mind says, "Oh, you would have held it together. You would have been fine." But the other part of me saying, "You're not that good." Mm -hmm. So that's the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all the process that got me to his feet, mm -hmm. and then everything that ensued after. I've seen too much, Charlemagne, and I've experienced too much to go back. I I I just had personal experience where it's like, dude, and I'm not the kind of person that can just read a rule book and then try to follow it. Like I need to feel something tangible, something that's real. I felt that and I feel that to this day. What made you start going to like seek therapy and things of that nature? Because a lot of people that's yeah. very spiritual, they say, oh, God is enough. What made you realize I needed something else? Well, I, I got great counselors at my church. Mm -hmm. I chose to go that route mm -hmm. because I wanted a godly perspective with it. You know, I don't knock anybody else. You got to know what's good for right. you, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but then it just kind of naturally happened. I wasn't like, all right, I'm going to make a conscious decision. I just started talking to my pastor and, and him being who he is, a wise man. He like, well, tell me about that. And I'm, I'm, I'm all of a sudden in a counseling session and didn't even realize that I was in a counseling session. Mm -hmm. But I knew I felt better after mm -hmm. talking about it. And then him telling, well, man, you may want to think about that, man. Man, I see. I know you're going through that right now, but God's going to see you through. And he had vision beyond what I was going through. That kind of stuff stimulated me, it gave me hope, it gave me the ability to believe that man, I can I can do this this husband thing, I can be a father, man, I could I could be in this career and still represent God and, and and not be weird or obnoxious about it, but just live the life in front of me. I can do this. So it just kind of happened, Charlemagne. It wasn't really a conscious decision, but I knew I felt better when I did it. Right. I knew I felt lighter. I knew it gave me hope, and I do it to this day. When I feel that pressure hit, yeah, I have my relationship with God, but I got a core group of brothers that I call. I got a, I got a, a few people at my church I can put past. I need to holler at you. Mm -hmm. I, I need to come. What's up? What's going on? Come to the house. Mm -hmm. I need that. Mm -hmm. So I just begin to see the value of it over time. You think every boxer should have uh, a therapy corner where people they can talk to because <laughs> yeah, they're going yeah. through so much. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I and think then, probably mo probably most probably everybody. Yeah, and then like everybody that you said, God sends you people sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like for that, like you said, you you received counseling in church. Didn't even know that mm -hmm. that is where. You know that that you were in counseling. Yeah. God will send you people. Yeah. You know, just like that. But speaking of um, what Envy just asked you, I just reported a story about Ryan Garcia and everything that he's going through now. Um, and we were having a conversation earlier about should they call his fight 
because mm. he seems to be, you Trouble know, just going spiraling. through so many things yeah. and so just, you know, and, and publicly we're seeing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how? what would you, what do you have to say to speak to that? Or He's in a tough spot right now because yeah. he got this fight coming up and you do not have time for self-care or you got to prepare for war. Mm. So it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, this stuff is coming at a bad time. And it didn't just come. This stuff has probably been going on. Yeah. And it's just showing itself now. I don't know about the social media stuff and if that stuff is him because he did put out a video saying that he didn't have access to his stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the things that I've heard him say, it seems odd. It seems mm -hmm. off. And I'm not trying to minimize or marginalize what he seems to be going through. But, you know, his father was like, oh, he's just trolling the wrong way. I've heard him say things about trolling. So I don't believe it's just trolling, but you you know, he's got a lot of followers. He's got a big following. You wonder like, man, is this some of this stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I think my gut is saying that it's real and it's just he's no longer uh, able to 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 hide it or, or keep it behind the scenes. Uh, he's in a real tough spot right now because of yeah. this fight. But I think, and I don't know if he should cancel the fight or if he's gonna even be able to get through a training. Training camp, it's a lot. It's pressure, man, every day. You are grinding physically, mentally. You taking punches. You dishing punches. You got some type of training session. And it's not just, oh, I'm just going to work out just to sweat. Like, you you pushing your body past the limit two, three times a day. That's a lot. When do you have time to focus on yourself? Mm. You don't. And he's not. So it, it's, it's, it's really sad to see. And, it, and it's really concerning to see because um, young kid with a lot, yeah. a lot of money, big following. But it's clearly something going on. And then... Also, with that image, a big image that they that these young boys have to live up to mm -hmm. now, because we have the internet, we have the social media, we have fan bases that are built off of you know their money, their social media, how they look. So, speaking to your book, killing the image is that yeah. what you're more so talking about? Yeah, yeah. I, I think with that is just you know by me essentially telling on myself mm -hmm. and sharing this side of my story, it may kill some images that people had. Man, I thought he never. Man, I couldn't see him doing that. That may do that. But that doesn't mean that who I am is is not real. I'm just giving mm -hmm. you the other side of the coin. Right. And when you talk about the social media stuff, that's why for me, like, like, it's not hard to create a viral moment. For me, mm -hmm. like the way my brain works. Like, I know I can come in here right now and say certain names and get a reaction and get more clicks and views, right? That's not how I'm wired, and I don't I don't get down like that. Feel free for us. Yeah, I know. Feel free. I know. Or, or if you just want to just, <laughs> yeah. just want to slap a co-host right now, yeah. that'll go viral. It's, it's yeah. all kind of stuff you can do. Yeah. <laughs> it's Absolutely. all kind of stuff you can say. I'll, I'll tell the tape, my boy tell you, I say, bro, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not. I try to let any viral moment I have be authentic and be real. Yeah. Right. But what you win the people with, you got to keep them with. Mm -hmm. And Ryan won the people over with sharing everything, mm -hmm. overly sharing, mm -hmm. right? So now he's going through it. He doesn't even feel like he can go through it in private. He feels the need to, like, bro, why are you sharing that? Why you do that yeah. video? Who told you to do that video? Well, I got to let the people mm. know. So he's in a tough spot because what you win the people with, you got to keep them with that. Mm. And that's the, the the tough spot you see him in right now. He can't even, he doesn't even know how to deal with life and deal with himself offline. He's too young. Yeah. And you can tell he's not, he's not been told because I can listen to you and hear you share certain things and say you you shouldn't you shouldn't have, that you shouldn't have shared that mm -hmm. now you shouldn't have said that or why are you doing this at the press conference he's young he don't understand so he feels like it's all fair game and he don't realize that's hurting him even more yeah and that's so interesting because when i think about ryan i started liking ryan because he was a good boxer yep right and and so the trolling and stuff that's kind of new to me and yeah. i feel like that came after he lost the tank. And it's like, you can't distract people from that loss. You just mm. got to move mm. on. Mm. And I think all of this talk of Good point. Devin going to beat you up, Devin yeah. going to beat you up, I think yeah. it's messing with him. Yeah. He don't want to experience that again. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's a good point. Mm. I think it is a distraction. Dude, like, like when you lose, and people say, oh, you ain't lost. But I remember my last loss. He said, you ain't lost in a long time. I remember it, which is why I ain't lost since. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It, it's like, bro, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a death. You, you mourning that thing. Especially when it's a high profile loss. And you get stopped the way that he did, you think it's over. We going home, right? You still living with that. You waking up Sunday morning, you got to get on your flight now. That 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 last night, what you did or didn't do, it's, 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 it's starting to sink in. Mm -hmm. The next coming months and year, all you hear and see is the loss. You got knocked out, man, shut up. We don't want to hear that. You got, man, you said you was going to win. You, it's, it, so he's, he's in a form of like mourning right now. Good point about him trying to distract people from it, but he ain't doing it the right way. And I don't know who he has around him mm -hmm. 
to pull his coattail and say, bro, little bro, we not doing that. That, we not doing that. Well, I got to tell the people, no, you don't. You need to win. That's, That's how right. you going to get over that mm-hmm. loss. That's right. Focus mm-hmm. on this. But, and I say the other thing too. I think that you, was, you were asking about, y'all was asking about should fighters get counseling and different things mm-hmm. like that. I think like most people should, probably all people, like I said, should have somebody that they can talk to. You got to be able to, like life mm-hmm. is going to happen, right? And just because you're not talking about it don't mean you're not going through it. But the alcohol and the drugs that I'm even seeing and hearing fight, like it was a thing, but it's even more a thing, right? Yeah. And some of that is trying to escape. Some of that is trying to deal with the pressure. Some of that is not having a counselor, not having a relationship with God and trying to deal with this pressure. But the only way I know how to deal with it is to go to the bottle or go to the weed or go to the drug or go to the women. And you just, I just, you just, again, I'm sounding like the old head. You, you live long enough and you just start to see like, man, you just don't want to have a good time. You running from something. And I try to do the best I can. I don't, you know, I'm not in these guys business or nothing like that. But when my phone rings or they reach out, man, I try to give them what I what I had. And that's the power of and you talk about this a lot, Charlemagne, of of telling my story. Mm-hmm. Like I've had so much feedback about, dude, I had no idea. Like, can I talk to you about this? Like I've had youngsters that I've been talking to for years and we normally only keep it boxing because they want to look a certain way in front of me. But now that I revealed that, can I talk to you about this, bro? I, I'm struggling with this. Mm-hmm. We, we, we need somebody to talk to, man. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Final question, because I, I want people to go watch the documentary, Ethel G, the book award, and pick up the book, uh, Killing the Image. But on the back of the book, you have, what if I die? Why did you have that question? What I, that was the moment that I was telling y'all about where mm-hmm. I felt like I was going to overdose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the moment. And for me being hard headed at that time in my life, that's what it took, unfortunately. But it's a it's a moment I'll never forget. And... um. You know, I hope that that, you know, I just like it's it's a lot of inspiration out there. Uh, and I think we should have people who are inspiring. We got to We got to be inspired. But I tried in this book, Charlemagne, and to give a roadmap. I want you to get inspired, but I also want you to have some practical things that you can take from my life, hopefully to help you through your situation that maybe by reading my story, you can see beyond your situation. And I hope that the book, the book did that because. This book will make you laugh, it'll make you cry, it'll inspire you, but but it also give you, like I said, some tools and some weapons to be able to fight your fight. People think that fighting is just for barbaric people or people who got that mentality. We're all fighting something and we're all gonna have to fight at some point in time. All of us are gonna have to toe that line mm-hmm. and say, Man, I'm I'm resisting this. I'm not I'm not gonna give in to this. It could be an addiction, it could be a lifestyle, it could be family members, it could be anxiety, whatever it is. So this is not a boxing book, just like I would tell people when I was pushing the doc. It's not a boxing doc. People always want to make it that. Mm. This is a human interest story, man. This is about a young man who had a dream, who almost lost it all, and gave his life to God, and has just been trying to walk this thing out and and, and do life, mm-hmm. it, but just do it better than my family members did it, and hopefully my kids will do it better than I did it. Yeah, that's right. There you have it. Andre Ward, ladies that's and right. gentlemen. Thank you for coming, brother. Hey, man, Thank I appreciate you so much, man. Me. Killing yes, the image. Bookstores everywhere right now. Everywhere you buy books, go get it. That's right. And it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.